things on the line, but it's 5.30, we're ready to start. This week we have GI2 looking at small intestine. So as we do every week, we have our little disclaimer that I'm just going to flip through. Again, as always, if you have questions about it, you can ask me either in a comment or you can DM me on Twitter. Uh, today we're going to talk about multiple things with the small intestine. Some of these are a little bit of misnomers, um, but I've tried to somewhat put them into categories to make it easier when you're looking at the different lesions to think of uh, differentials and, and things that are kind of similar. Okay, starting with inflammatory lesions, case one. So we have some biopsy here slightly higher power, we see that there's some burner glands here that points us probably in the duodenal section. Um, but this looks kind of weird because it's like, you're not, the small intestine shouldn't look this flat and <laughs> blunted, and I guess that's the key term. Yes. blue. So um, let's go for higher power. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, you know, lymphocytes and plasma cells probably sitting around in here. Um, and then you notice that, yeah, there's the villi, there's like pretty much no folding, infolding, it's very blunted. Um, and then you look at the individual epithelial cells, there are some lymphocytes inside the epithelium. I'm not going to count them all. Yeah, here, don't do that. But yeah, but you know, this is pr pretty, you know, you, you should have very high suspicion for like a celiac disease, you know, look up the history should tell you a little more, but yeah, just I would say celiac disease without any other. Okay. Yeah. All right, he's confident. Well, uh, not surprisingly, this is celiac disease. Uh, so it's relatively uncommon, even though I know we all see things all the time where uh, it seems like maybe more than about 1% of the population is reporting uh, gluten sensitivity. Um, but true celiac disease. Um, also known as celiac sprue or gluten sensitive enteropathy or gluten induced enteropathy, really has a bimodal age distribution where we see a peak in children and again in adults, but there's no sex predilection. Uh, we see it a lot more often in Caucasian patients than we do in, say, African or Asian uh, ethnicities. And the patients will come in complaining most likely of abdominal pain, a lot of diarrhea, maybe even steatic. Uh, Sciatoria, and that's when they have a uh, really fatty diarrhea and it floats and it's extremely foul smelling. Uh, on, our, on our scale of foul smelling, this is up there with like melania and, and stuff like that. Okay? Um, and because they're having diarrhea and malabsorption, they're likely to also have weight loss or iron deficiency anemia. Uh, if they're a child or elderly, you can also think of failure to thrive. And they might even just have things that are like irritable bowel syndrome-like symptoms. So really a, a wide spectrum of, of disease. On endoscopy, they may see scalloping or loss of folds in the duodenum. Um, because again, as was pointed out, th this disease involves a lot of blunting of the villi. However, loss of scalloping or loss of folds in the duodenum is not specific for celiac. So even if they see that, that doesn't tell you right away it's celiac disease. They should take biopsies from both the duodenal bulb and the distal duodenum. They should label them separately. Of course, this is ideal. Uh, and in a, in a perfect world, we would get this every single time. Um, but more often than not, you're going to get all the biopsies together. And the thing that's really going to tell you you're in the duodenum for sure is the burner's glands. If you don't have those, you can't say you're in duodenum. You'll just simply say like you're in uh, small bowel. Um, okay, so when we're looking at microscopy, uh, one of the things that was mentioned was the intraepithelial lymphocytes. So here I have some really good examples of increased uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes or IELs on the top where you can see like that's uh, markedly increased. There's also maybe some flattening of the folds, we're not seeing villi. On the bottom picture, what we have towards the left, that's a normal villus. And to the right, you see the increased cells, the increased lymphocytes. Um, so that's just to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking for as far as numbers. Uh, da, 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 when you're counting them, so 
numbers vary depending on what source you're looking at, but for the most part they're going to say you should be seeing more than six neutrophils per epithelial cells, and that should be at the tips of the villi, okay? And you want to make sure that you're not trying to count lymphocytes when you're around or over top of a lymphocytic aggregate, um, because it's actually normal for uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes to be increased in those areas. Um, if it's if you have like really focal areas where you're seeing increased lymphocytes, a good idea is to get some levels because you might actually be looking at a lymphoid aggregate in the area. Um, I have a little bit here about the Marsh lesions. Uh, the Marsh lesions are just criterion to help you figure out uh, the severity of celiac disease. They are by no means specific. Um, I do have the chart for the Marsh uh, Oberhuber lesions uh, in the handout. And uh, something else that's included in the handout that is not here uh, is the comparison between celiac and peptic duodenitis. So if you're not sure how to compare the two of those, um, make sure you check that out in the PDF. Uh, one of the other things that you can see and is present in this case um, is crypt hyperplasia. So that's where you're going to see increased mitotic activity within the crypts. Uh, you can see neutrophils in the lamina propria, and again, that's if you're also looking at is there maybe peptic duodenitis uh, involved with this. They can occur together, but they can also look very similar, so make sure you are aware of the differences between those. Okay, for figuring out is this celiac, we don't really do IHC. IHC is not really helpful. Um, the point that I didn't really go over on the previous slide said that CD3 is not going to help you with this. Uh, what will help you though is serology. So you can do either your tissue transglutaminase for IgG or IgA titers. Uh, this is specific and sensitive. You can do uh, anti endonasal antibody or EMA, uh, but that's labor intensive, so it's unlikely that most labs would even offer it. Um, and what's really interesting about the titers is that you can use these to actually see if the patient's responding to treatment. Um, molecular, most of these will have some sort of uh, HLA uh, abnormality. So either the HLA DQ2, which is the most common, or the DQ8. Um, but pretty much every single celiac disease case should have uh, some sort of HLA going on. Uh, your differentials, we talked about peptic duodenitis, is this simply bacterial overgrowth? And also along the same lines, think about tropical sprue, is a medication that should pretty much be on your differential for anything in the GI tract, uh, including ulmosartan and enteropathy. Um, the treatment for this, so this is true gluten sensitivity and reaction to gluten, so they should be on a lifelong gluten-free diet. Most patients will actually respond to this diet change within a couple of days and be in remission in weeks to months. However, there are things such as refractory celiac disease. Um, and what this tends to be is um, patients who don't respond at all to the, the diet and they, can, they are at risk of developing lymphoma. Uh, there's more information about the lymphoma in your handout. And... Um, some of the other complications are listed below. So the uh, EDL or enteropathy associated T-cell lymphoma, that's the lymphoma that is typically associated with both type 1 and type 2 RCD or refractory celiac disease. Uh, type 2 has a worse prognosis than type 1. Uh, and that's pretty much it for celiac. Case 2. Another case of biopsies, very blue at low power. So we're going to expect a lot of lymphocytes. Do we have lymphocytes? Well, sort of. <laughs> a lot of glands. <laughs> and lymphocytes, maybe. Let's see. Yeah, lymphocytes. Okay. So looking at this, this is like small intestine. I need to see if there's any definitive Brenner's gland or we just couldn't call it. Not seeing anything that's definitively. Definitively, um. 
Brunner's gland, so I'm going to just call this small intestine for now. Okay. Um, so looking at this, I guess the most striking feature is just there seems to be a lot of like like lymphocytes in the sort of the strong of the lamina propria, I would say, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that shouldn't be there. Um, which kind of reminds you or makes you reminiscent of the celiac disease we saw earlier. Um, not as prominent blunting or even intrathelial lymphocytes as the other case, though. So maybe there's a few lymphocytes here and here. Um, but, you know, it is part of, you know, you sh I guess you sh it is part of the differential given the picture because some areas look a little more effective than others. Um, but I think one thing is there's a lot more eosinophils here that yeah. wasn't in the other one. Yeah, so the other one had a lot of blood. Yeah, but I the, think these are eosinophils, right? Yeah, those yeah. are eosinophils. Which is very different. Is uh, well, something else similar. that's pink on this slide that kind of catches your eye? Let's see. Maybe look at the crypts. Down these things. Yeah, something that's intensely eosinophilic. Almost looks like eosinophils, but it's not. Yeah, do you know what those are? There's some better examples there. Oh, huh. It's these not really part of this, but it's kind of something that once it was pointed out to me when I was rotating on GI a, a good while back. Um, as a feature of chronicity. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of eosinophilic granule looking things here. Mm -hmm. Don't know what That's they okay. are. I, I, <laughs> I didn't pay attention to this at all until it was pointed out to me. Um, but these are, this is like pan cell change. Okay. So that just has to do with oh, chronicity. Yeah. So true. whatever's going on here, it's been happening for quite some time. So that's not the disease process, no. sort of. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we have lots of eosinophils. There is some focal blunting. Yeah. Uh, and there are some increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. Yeah it's, yeah, it's not as prominent as our previous case, but is this something that you could still think maybe this is celiac? Could be. I guess clinical history would help. Okay, so let's say. Uh, this patient was seen six months ago, mm -hmm. had all the complaints consistent with celiac. Yeah. They biopsied it, looked like this. Mm -hmm. They put the patient on a gluten free diet and for six yeah. months, and this is what the six month out biopsy looks like. Patients so it didn't work. Didn't it work. didn't work. So it's not celiac. We're kind of rolling that out. Um, so, I mean, I guess it could be tropical sprue. Okay. Um, or any of the other medications, if she's on any medications, it can also cause these. So, and the differential that we previously seen, the celiac disease, yeah, could potentially be it. Yeah, because what if this is refractory? Yeah. But okay, I wouldn't do that to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> we just went over celiac disease, so I'm not going to give you another celiac disease. Mm -hmm. But okay, so this is a, a caveat and a lovely mimic of celiac. This is tropical sprue. And pretty much what helps you are those increased eosinophils. Usually they're a lot more prominent than this. So this is either something that they've started to treat and it's more mild or they've caught it really early on. Because usually the eos are, are really, really prominent. And to be honest, when I was reviewing the slides quickly again today before the, the lecture, um, since I hadn't seen them in over a week, I, I wasn't overly impressed with it. But... That's what they're calling it, and it is it is consistent. So, anyway, I digress. Tropical sprue, also known as post-infective tropical malabsorption. So this is endemic in a lot of areas close to the equator. Um, can manifest in both residents and visitors, right? Because it's uh, post-infectious, so anyone is susceptible to the infection. Uh, however, it has not been identified in sub-Saharan Africa as well as Jamaica. Um, because it's infection, there, and there's no real age or gender predilection. 
uh, and we don't really know what causes it. Uh, there's some theories floating around about um, like is it an E. coli or Klebsiella, um, different protozoa, or a viral. Um, but the the cluster of symptoms uh, is fairly similar to celiac disease. What can be different though is that they might complain of myalgias or muscle pain. There could be fever, again, post-infectious, and uh, they could also have anemia. Well, anemia can occur with celiac disease too, so maybe not so specific. Um, and then I have a whole bunch of things that are related to vitamin deficiencies, mostly B vitamins, but your glossitis, angular stomatitis, corneal xerosis, and night blindness. Uh, on endoscopy, usually it's um, not going to be overly remarkable, but what I have in the little inset picture of endoscopy is sometimes it can have these um, areas that will really mimic more uh, advanced celiac disease where maybe it's a little flattened or maybe it has um, erythematous areas. On microscopic, uh, basically you're going to see something that looks almost identical to celiac disease. What we mentioned before is what should be the most striking thing is that your eosinophils and the lamina propria should be far more pronounced than in celiac. Um, and uh, they could be increased along with your uh, IELs if they did a colonic bi biopsy. Uh, and you may also find the megaloblastic nuclei if they were like B12 or folate deficient. Um, okay, so the bottom picture pretty much is just showing your increased uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes and the top picture is pretty much what our uh, biopsy looked like, uh, where it's just lots and lots of inflammation. There's no IHC that's really going to help you. Uh, your molecular, there's a possible connection uh, to some HLA, HLA um, immunophenotypes, but um, again, we don't really know what causes this, and uh, the history is really going to be your best thing. Your differential is going to be very similar to celiac disease. Uh, however, you're going to include some extra bugs in there, okay? Uh, treatment for this is that they're going to do long-term antibiotics as well as folate therapy. If they're B12 deficient, they'll give them B12 uh, supplementation. And uh, these patients tend to do great once they're treated, but unfortunately, they're often missed or even misdiagnosed as celiac disease. And remember, this is not going to respond to a gluten-free diet. Um, and obviously, if you live in an area where the uh, whatever is going on with this is uh, endemic, then your chance of relapse is actually pretty high. Uh, as far as pictures, up at the top, we just have lots of examples of increased ep epithelial, intraepithelial lymphocytes. And on the bottom, again, that's just kind of showing uh, more of your crip hyperplasia, as well as increased eosinophils. Um, so just keep those in mind. They tend to look very similar to each other. This is where the misnomer comes in. Um, because tropical sprue may be related to uh, infection, even though we don't really know what's going on there, these are all things that are definitely associated with infection. So that's why they are labeled this way. Case three. Okay. More chunks of intestine biopsy. Again, very blue. Mm -hmm. Lots of lymphocytes. We have some nice burner glands here. So we could say do them this time. Um, not that much blunting at low power compared to will be seen, but definitely a lot of like, you know, lymphocytes and lamina propria. And um, let's see what we have here. Let's go around, around. a few intra-epithelial lymphocytes, not, okay. not that many. Um, maybe a few eos 
here and there. So uh, until you've seen quite a few, you know, like 50,000 of everything, which it takes a while to get there, um, these can be hard to recognize. I still can't see H. pylori. <laughs> uh, I mean, I could see it once it's there and like pointed it out. All this stuff. Okay. Yeah, recognize? there's something there. I have some annotated parts if that might help. Okay. single time they're always like if there's like duty I was like always check for Giardia always check for Giardia it's usually nothing there so it's great to finally see a case where there's actual so Giardia this is what you tend to see more of so this is what's called the falling leaves pattern so it's not schmutz that's just kind of sloughed off mm -hmm. and if you start looking in the crypts you'll start seeing it kind of everywhere um, but those were just some really good areas where I was saying uh, like this is a really good example of Giardia where it looks more like the classic micro picture that they always love to show us in basic sciences. Yes. Um, but this is uh, what I think I see more of is the falling leaves pattern. Okay. Um, so the annotations will stay on these slides so you should be able to see them when you go back and review this. And you'll start seeing it's everywhere on, on okay. this case. Okay? Drinking too much raw <laughs> water. Yeah. <laughs> Do not drink well. <laughs> um, so Giardia, most common protozoal infection in the U.S., water, and it is chlorine resistant. So if you're in a pool that is contaminated with Giardia, it's not going to help. Um, most people are asymptomatic, actually. But if they have diarrhea, it's going to be explosive, watery, foul-smelling. So unlike the steatorrhea, this is just going to be watery but not frothy and fluffy. Okay? My question is, when is, like, Fecal matter not foul smelling. That's something that well, always bothered me. Okay. <laughs> you know? I, I know it's a different have... smell, but it's like to say it's foul smelling, kind of, it's like. It's kind of like this is like the extra level <laughs> where, you know, like in cartoons and stuff where they have like the green smoke fog that's coming out. This is that kind of smell. <laughs> I could say that for all. I don't know. It's, it's yeah, just. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the extra, extra bad. Um, so again, because they have diarrhea, so we need to think about their going to dehydration, malabsorption, think about failure to thrive, uh, all that diarrhea, they're probably going to have some abdominal pain, um, they could complain of just nausea, or they're throwing up all the time, uh, they could have fever, and very rarely, if it's really bad, they could have eosinophilia or, or even urticaria. Um, obviously, like really young, immunocompromised, use of untreated water, and travel to foreign countries. And why travel to foreign countries? It's possible that you're going to be exposed to untreated water. Okay, small bowel is most common and usually proximal, so in the duodenum. Um, but you can also see it in the stomach and colon. So just because you get a colon biopsy and the history sounds like Giardia, you should still look for it. There's nothing to see on endoscopy. Uh, and as we saw, the, the trophozoites are those pear-shaped uh, entities that have uh, the two round ovoid nuclei or eyes, and they have the little curly cue for, for hair if you want to think that they look like a face. Um, they also tend to fall into the falling leaves pattern, so uh, the two main pictures on this slide are showing the falling leaves pattern. First at low power, and then the bottom picture is a zoomed in photo of the same spot. Uh, and the inset is just showing how you can have those falling leaves like right in the crypt. So um, just because it's not super obvious on the surface, you still need to look for it. Um, they can have villus blunting, 
incorrect hypoplasia. So just because it's not tropical sprue and it's not celiac, you can still see the same things. Um, they may or may not have uh, increased inflammation. Often they don't, and if they're immunocompromised, you really should not expect to see an inflammatory response. Um, but you should still always check to see if there's plasma cells in the lamina propria. Again, immunocompromised, I would be really surprised to find plasma cells. Okay, so they can do PCR on this uh, to identify the organism. Don't need to worry about molecular for this uh, and differential for this, normal bowel, right? Like maybe it's just it's sloughed, it's, uh, it waited too long before it was um, processed. Lots of different things can do that. They're gonna give them uh, antibiotics and most commonly they're gonna give them metronidazole or flagyl. And as long as they're treated, they have an excellent prognosis. In some cases, it will even resolve spontaneously. Um, but you do have to worry about chronic geroidiasis in immunocompromised patients. And then we just have a couple more pictures of the falling leaves pattern, uh, just to give you a few more views of that. Right. I four. see dots. Yeah, I know. That's the first thing that I see. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot erase <laughs> the dots once they are there. So, again, very blue, mm -hmm. very inflamed, look at dots, focus on dots then. So again, it's small intestine, okay, let's do the proper, small intestine, I think these are burner glands here, they're a little pale, foamy looking. Yeah, it looks like so, it. So, let's say do on them. Alright, what's in the lamb appropriate? So, lots of lymphocytes in blue, but um, hmm. this one is very subtle. Okay. So you want to look right at those dots. That's kind of my hint for you. Right at the dots. Yeah, like in that. Like this thing. Well, that could be maybe your, your gang else. there, yeah, it's like right above that, if you can see it. It might not be coming across too clear. There's a few more in the area. There's a beautiful one. No one's there. Right there. This one? Yeah. Okay, it's something, it's small. Yeah, it's, it is very small, small, yes. And very easy to miss. Let's check out the other dot before we go any further. This one's hard. It's kind of in here and you can't see it too well. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Assuming there's something there. It's so it is so small. <laughs> and maybe there might even be some more over here. Okay. But it's so small, it's really, really hard to see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. All this. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's yeah, probably. It doesn't project very well, but it kind of just. And then here's some more here. Schmutz. You can okay. see them. They're so small, so small. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> so, so some sort of infection that's very small. Super small. Micro. In the name? Micro is in the name, <laughs> yes. Microsporidia. Yeah. Microsporidia, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Th these might be the best examples, maybe okay. in this guy here. Oh, okay, yeah, it's like that one I think is probably the best one. That I have better pictures. See, better pictures. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> microsporidia, uh, I am not going to attempt to pronounce these, um, but I have the two of them in there. So E intestinalis and E binusi. So those are the two of, two of this uh, species or family that can infect humans. Um, it was originally thought to be protozoa, but now it's classified as a fungus, okay? Um, present in water, animal hosts, so you need to think about human-human spread, fecal oral spread, um, just like a lot of other things, they're going to complain of diarrhea. This is going to be chronic, non-bloody, non-mucoid, and it's going to get worse with food. Um, so again, they'll be dehydrated, malabsorption, weight loss, so all these things just kind of keep re repeating our risk factors, immunocompromised. So you need to check if 
they're HIV positive, um, maybe they're a transplant patient, but HIV tends to be uh, one of the really common things for this. These are really rare infections to have an immunocompetent host. So if you're seeing this and there's nothing in the history to tell you that this patient's immunocompetent, you might want to suggest uh, some additional testing by the clinician. Okay, most commonly they infect the small bowel, but it can infect any part, including the biliary tree. So you need to worry about, what, is this actually a cause for sclerosis and cholangitis? Uh, and if that's not scary enough, E. intestinalis, which is the most common, can also disseminate. Your endoscopy, again, is going to be unremarkable, which kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, so small we can't see it. So again, so small that they can't see it on endoscopy. Uh, that's how I try to remember these things. So if that helps you, great. If you have something else to help you remember uh, all these different things, be sure to let us know so that we can get all these um, excellent study tips out to everyone. So a microscopic, it often can look normal. With very vocal or mild blunting, there could be some lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate like we saw in our case. Um, usually it's patchy and there can be increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. Doesn't this sound like pretty much everything we've seen so far today? However, there can be some epithelial disarray and you can see vacuolization, which is what we did see in our case. And this, the vacuoles can either um, form a cup-like impression or flatten the nucleus, but on the superior luminal aspect of the movement, or of the nucleus, okay? Uh, the organism is very small, two, three micrometers, um, and the plasmodia are a little larger. So you can see in the gram stain uh, to the right that the spores are staining uh, with the gram stain, and then you have uh, the open arrows are pointed towards the plasmodia, okay? And just like we saw in our case, they tend to be located towards the lumen. Um, it is a little more obvious when you can see the slides on your screen, so make sure you go back to those slides uh, and spend a little bit of time on them. And what's interesting is that these are actually um, polarizable on H&E sometimes, so um, that's something that you can try as well if you're suspicious. You may require electron microscopy, um, but not always. Stains, so think uh, fungal stains. So GAMSA, you can do a gram stain, you can do a trichrome, you can use PCR, you can use uh, EM. And, you know, uh, I haven't been in the pathology game too long, but as they would say in the olden days, you would do a stool exam as well as histology. But uh, PCR is much more sensitive and specific than stool exams and histology. And you may actually even be in a place that doesn't offer stool uh, exams anymore either. Your differential is mostly going to be other uh, infectious things. So Cyclospora, Isospora, and Cryptosporidium. Treatment is mostly supportive. Um, you can use antimicrobials, but they don't always work. Um, so fumagillin can be used for uh, both types of infection, but albendazole will not be effective for ebuniacy. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and obviously because immunocompromised patients um, present with a lot of difficulties with infectious disease that this is no different and they can be very difficult to treat in immunocompromised patients. Uh, both of these pictures on, on this slide are trichrome stains, so you can just see how nicely they highlight the organisms. Um, both the um, both the spores. And yeah. Okay. So that's why I have for microsporidia. Case. <laughs> right. More dots. Five. <laughs> Five. <laughs> Yes, more dots. Okay. It's going to take a That's just crushing. That looks crushed. Kind of Anyways, um, going back to what we're supposed to look at. So, um, again, this is small intestine. Uh, maybe, well, no definitive burner's gland, so let's just say small intestine. Um, the lie looks okay. 
Madame Purple looks a little blue, a little more filmy, but I think, no, I think it's just a section. Never mind. Um, I see dots. And I see stuff. Mm -hmm. These are not lymphocytes that escape the intestine, I don't think. I think these are true organisms. They're bigger yeah. than the microsporidia. So it's some sort of infection. And part of the differentials of microsporidia is this is like cyclospora or something. I don't know. There's a few more over here. Okay. Here. They're kind of all over the place. Yeah. Okay, so what what was in our differential for microsporidia? Cyclospora. Spora or ISO, ISO, but I think maybe it's, I don't know. And one of those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, this is uh, <laughs> Cyclospora. Worldwide, again, again, ingested of contaminated food, water, person to person contact. We are just not getting away from this today. Again, watery mucoid, non bloody diarrhea with malabsorption, weight loss. They might complain of anorexia. Uh, so different from the microsporidia, which was worse with food, this they're just not going to want to eat. Uh, so related to that, they'll have generalized malaise. They could have abdominal pain or nausea. They could have fever. And again, you need to think about if the biliary tree is infected instead of um, sclerosing cholangitis, this you could think about a calculus uh, cholecystitis. Um, so that that would be like you know they're complaining of of uh, right upper gastric pain similar to uh, gallstones risk factors surprise surprise if they're immunocompromised uh, if they're traveling to foreign countries this is often a cause of traveler's diarrhea um, again it likes warmer climates but it is seen everywhere there's nothing to mention on the gross just like um, microsporidia. Microscopic, we could see those blunting. Uh, you could see increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, and there could be lamina propria inflammation. Uh, if it's present, it should not be prominent, and you can have superficial epithelial disarray, usually with some apoptosis. So nothing so far has sounded different from everything else we've seen. The organisms tend to be found in the upper third of the epithelial cell towards the luminal surface. They are round forms. Um, so uh, they're two, three uh, micrometers. The merozoites uh, tend to also be present in vacuoles. These are larger. And uh, the merozoites are what's being shown on the bottom large picture with the open arrows. So they're very uh, finger-like or crescent-shaped uh, compared to um, your uh, round forms, which are um, more similar to your microsporidia, okay? Um, overall, this is pretty much going to look like a so isospora, but just smaller. So lots of examples of that. These are partially acid fast, so that's a little different. Um, and you can't see these on stool exam, but again, our stool exam may not be offered. It's not overly specific, but you can do it. Uh, and they may use PCR to identify the organism. Your differential, everything that we've just talked about, including normal mucosa, uh, treatments, uh, also antibiotic therapy, but they tend to use Bactrim in this case instead of um, like whether they're going to use al albendazole or or some of the other things used in other infections. And they're also going to use su supportive care, which makes sense, again, because a lot of diarrhea, malabsorption. Um, so these patients just need to be su supported um, for everything that they've been pumping out with this disease, as well as antibiotic therapy. It's usually self-limited, um, but that's considering an immunocompetent host. And this could be three weeks to a month. Um, it can be severe, it can be prolonged in immunocompromised hosts, so you want to think again, are they HIV, 
Are they uh, receiving chemotherapy maybe? Are they a transplant patient? All things to consider. More examples of cyclospora. Okay, so we are moving away from the epithelial lesions. Um, within the handout, uh, expert path had a really nice diagram that kind of explained uh, the difference, the different coccidia uh, in the small bowel. So I encourage you to take a look at that, as well as just a reminder um, that there's the celiac disease versus papilloidosis, as well as the Marsh Oberhuber classification. So make sure you go over those since they aren't covered in uh, this presentation specifically. Okay, epithelial lesions. Case six. Okay. So we have sort of a larger resection. It's not a biopsy. Um, just a quick look. It does look like more small intestine mucosa mm -hmm. here. And you have nice stromal. And then you have this thing here that looks, I don't know what it is. Let's zoom in. So it's surrounded by like muscularis propria looks like here. Okay. Yeah. It's an adipose right. tissue. Uh, so I guess my question for you is does it fit with where you are? So you said you're in small intestine. Yeah. So does that stuff fit? I mean that this intestine? doesn't look like this looks more like pancreas. Yeah. It looks like pancreas, yeah. right? And how about the other stuff? Mm, kind of hard, hard to tell, but it's, it could be small. Oh, there's some panis cells, right? Not mm -hmm. that, yeah. And this looks more like gastric. Yeah. Looks mucinous, yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, gastric, okay. Okay, so we so have pancreas and stomach in the small intestine, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you that this is ileum. Okay, so they're not in the right place. They're not in the right place. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not even in the, the right county at this point. <laughs> Played Pokemon Go and took a wrong turn. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so Tried too hard to get that shiny Pokemon. Um, so it's like a Meckel's diverticulum, probably. Probably, okay. So what do you know about Meckel's? It's like the rules of two or something. It's like, oh, I forgot the... Yeah. Things, yeah. It's two. So 2% <laughs> of the population... <laughs> two centimeters from the ileocecal? Yeah, uh, within two feet of the ileocecal yeah. valve, they'll be two inches in length. They tend to be... Uh, present by the age of two, and it has two types of mucosa. <laughs> Rules of two, yeah, aren't those nice? Obviously, uh, not everybody fits this because they might just have, you know, like gastric mucosa, but then you'd have um, intestinal mucosa, like small bowel going back to gastric mucosa. Uh, what's a little frustrating with, with this picture is that it's not super obvious that you're in a diverticula. Um, but these are true diverticula, so you should have like complete layers around. Sort um, of, it's trying to form. It's this. trying to, and yeah. it might just be in a different section, like yeah. we just might not be in the right section, but. Uh, okay, so most common congenital malformation of the GI tract, that's what GIT stands for, or GIT. One to four percent of the population, but on average, two, because we have the rule of two, so we're sticking with that. Uh, it can be any age, males tend to uh, have it more than females, 
and most of them are asymptomatic, but less than 5% of them will uh, become symptomatic at some point during their life. Um, often in adults, it would present with either obstruction or diverticulitis, right, because it is a true diverticuli. And in children, you could have a GI bleed, and it's actually the most common cause of GI bleeds in children. Uh, complications from this, so if they have like diverticulitis, think about perforation, abscess formation, uh, obstructive symptoms, right, because when we think about uh, terminal ileum and you can get uh, intussusception or volvulus even around the lymphoid aggregate, if you have something like this, that could cause the same thing. Uh, and they rarely get malignancies, which would be, you would think, both neuroendocrine as well as lymphoma. We already talked about the gross. But as you can see in the gross photo, we have uh, terminal ileum, and it is a blind pouch diverticulum that is present on the anti-mesenteric border. Um, the technetium scan is the most specific test, and what this does is when they run the scan, you're going to have a hot spot in the right uh, lower quadrant. However, the problem is, is that if they're complaining of intestinal pain, and you have a hot spot in the right lower quadrant, you need to make sure that's not appendicitis. Um, and you can also have false negatives in patients that don't have gastric mucosa because the uh, technetium actually uh, focuses on gastric mucosa. So just because they have two types of mucosa, gastric isn't necessarily one of them, um, even though uh, it, it is relatively common. Okay, as we mentioned, true diverticulum, so all layers of your GI tract should be present. So um, uh, like we were talking about, you know, a, a nicer section of that would have been seeing uh, the muscularis all the way around that ectopic tissue. Uh, so you can see gastric or pancreatic mucosa, and with gastric you need to think about, well, what does the stomach do? It produces acid, so the acid can actually cause ulceration and bleeding elsewhere in the GI tract, and that's where you're getting that GI bleeding from. Uh, there's no IHC really to help you uh, if you want to, I mean, it would stain for whatever um, stains are in the, the tissue normally, um, because it is normal tissue, it's just in the wrong location. There's no molecular for this, there really isn't a differential for this, um, because it's, it's not normal, and it's not in locations where you would think, oh, like, maybe this is just, um, you know, a, a little bit of a rest or something like that. Um, treatment, they're going to excise it, and that's curative. These don't come back once they excise them. And their prognosis is generally excellent post-surgery. Uh, so we just have a few more examples there um, of gastric mucosa and intestinal mucosa, just to kind of give you that delineation. And that's normally what you will see. Um, and the inset, kind of hard to see, but looks like paracel, so maybe we have some pancreatic tissue in there. Okay, case seven. Ooh, okay. Um, something. <laughs> um, okay, so something, I love it. Let's start with the epithelium. Ooh, okay. Um, that's not normal. I don't, at least I hope it's that's not normal. There's a lot of gland, like it's very glandular and it's kind of like in this weird distorted, it's not really forming any like serious try it doesn't look like it's trying to do anything. <laughs> Let's just say it's kind of just like there and there's just way too much crowding, which looks really disorganized and it's even like going into this room with a lot of like inflammation, like inflammatory reaction to it. So um so it looks very blue because it has a lot of cells. So, because of this general feel, you know, I, you know, want to say this is some sort of tumor, okay. um, and it's forming glands. So I'm gonna say it's probably an adenocarcinoma of some sort. We could zoom in on one of these glands and just take a look at the. Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, not pretty. Um, you know, these are not happy nuclei. They don't seem to have. I guess this one's not projecting too well. Let's see if we can find out. But like the nuclei are like very weird. They're like pale with like these chocolate chip chromatin in some of them and what do you have some in other the ones. The There's Luna. that's like almost like an abscess. Okay, yeah. Is there a crypt abscess type thing, sort of, if it was in the Okay. There's some areas that are a little better. Okay. It's kinda of 
kind of feature. Oh, there you go. Oh, keep going up a little bit. Oh, that. Oh, this. What do we call this? Necrosis. Very close. Or plus plus. Oh, okay. So yes, yeah, so you could say like, oh, this is fibropurulent debris or, yeah. or pus. Um, but we have a, a name that we like to use in GI called dirty necrosis. Okay. Okay. I'll go with that. But this is probably like I mix with abscess. This is pretty prominent. Yeah. But um, these are not normal cells. No. These are very angry cells. These are cancerous cells. So it's a adenocarcinoma. Mm. Can you tell from where? Tell from where? Like what? What part? Okay. Yeah. Like, is this a lung adeno? Is this um, prostate, stomach, colon, small bowel? Anything to help you out? Well, I don't know morphologically, but we could throw some stains in. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you What do you want to throw at it? See uh, how helpful I can be with this. Okay. Um, we could do a sat. Is it sat B two or called like intestinal? Like okay. So that. Happy to would should be negative. Okay. CDX two. It's gonna be positive. Positive. Okay. I guess CK seven, CK twenty two grew up. Although CK seven probably if there's a sign enough, I don't know if this would be. So CK seven and CK twenty are positive. positive. Okay. Not very helpful. Um, I'm trying not to be helpful actually. Okay. <laughs> because um, twenty can swing either way. Yeah. On this yeah. actually. Okay. I don't know, like it's just, it's not really f having, it doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't look like it has that colonic look to it maybe. I haven't seen that many like small intestine primary adenos, so I don't know what that looks like. So here's the, the clincher is that small intestinal adeno mm -hmm. uh, very often looks like colonic adeno. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and it stains very similar. So the, the SAT B2, I believe, should be negative. Um, by all means, somebody can correct me on that. Uh, if, if it would be positive, I, I honestly don't know. Um, but I would imagine it would be negative because it, SAT B2 is pretty specific for colon. Mm -hmm. um, but morphologically, this tends to look very similar to colonic adeno. Okay. Yeah. So that's why it's like the CK7 should be positive and the 20 may or may not yeah. be, so it's not really helpful. Yeah. But I do think it's invasive. It looks like it's kind of just. This is pushing. definitely invasive, yeah. yeah. So it's invasive, add no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy with that? <laughs> it's like, I guess, relatively well differentiated, I would say, mm -hmm. because it's forming glands. And yeah. doing a decent job at it, sort of. Yeah, like we're looking at this going, this is adenocarcinoma. Yeah. Um, but I guess, yeah, my point of asking you origin was just to kind of get across that it's like the, they do look very similar, so it's not easy to tell. Um, hopefully from that bottom picture, you can see why it's a little harder to differentiate is this small or, or large intestine. Um, so in the small bowel, these only account for 2.4% of all GI tract malignancies. They're far more common in, in men at two to one. Uh, symptoms are gonna be very similar to everything else we've seen. What you wanna add in is there may be jaundice or cholestasis if you have like an ampullary tumor. Uh, risk factors, so patients who have long-standing Crohn disease, um, patients with celiac disease, uh, so you need to think about this. Um, increased relative risk is between 10 to 80 times, okay? And when that happens with celiac disease, most of them are going to be microsatellite unstable. So that's methylation of MLH1, well, related to methylation of MLH1. Uh, all the associations with the polyposis syndromes, 
and um, over half of these will occur in the duodenum, so you, that risk of uh, ampullary tumors is, is quite real. Um, and then about a fifth of them will be in the jejunum, 13% in the ileum, and not otherwise specified is the other 14%. Uh, they're going to look nearly identical to your colorectal carcinomas, so you can have that dirty necrosis. Uh, you could have mucin production, and it may even be abundant. Um, so with Crohn's disease, they're going to arise from either adenomas or dysplasias, same with your polyposis syndromes. Um, and you may not have desmoplasia, so you really need to think about that um, in the setting of if they have Crohn-associated dysplasia, okay? Um, and if it's in the duodenum, they could look intestinal, gastric, or pan pancreatic or biliary phenotype. Um, the duodenum is just really indecisive and can't figure out what it wants to do, so it could look like anything. Stains, CK7, variable CK20, uh, like I said, I'm not sure about SATB2, but it should be negative. If it's mucinous, CDX2 would be positive. Uh, remember, CDX2 is not specific for anything, it's specific for mucinous tumors. Molecular, they're not going to have mutations uh, in the APC gene, unless you're looking at a, a familial ad adenomatosis Polyposis. Uh, polyposis. Thank you. Or a fat case. Uh, and uh, P53 SMAD4 mutations are often present. So that's something a little different. P53, not, not so helpful because a lot of things have that, but SMAD4, that's something that's a little different. So uh, try to remember that. Uh, often they're just going to do a segmental resection, um, but they will take the small bowel and on the mesentery they'll go wide. Uh, if you have an ampullary lesion, they're going to do a Whipple resection, and your chemotherapy is pretty much going to be whatever they would do for colorectal, um, but there's not enough data because, again, 2.4%, there's not a lot of these floating around. Um, prognosis is linked to staging, uh, overall five-year survival, it's about one-third of patients will survive, and uh, duodenal tumors generally have worse prognosis than uh, other areas of the small intestine. So we just have a few more pictures. Um, you can see from the, the gross photo on top is, you know, this could be a polypoid lesion, it could be ulcerated, pretty much it's gonna look the same as a uh, colonic mass. And uh, all the histology photos underneath, again, uh, looking like uh, colonic, uh, colorectal carcinoma, sorry. Okay, moving on to stromal lesions. And the stromal lesions are our last section, okay? So everything here is stroma. Case eight. Oh, okay. Well, it's definitely stroma. Very um, cellular, a little bit faded, but it does have a lot of cells in it. Um, higher power, it seems to be, the cells look relatively I would say monotonous well. On higher power, they look kind of, you do see some variations. They're kind of round. Mm -hmm. um, they're more round than spindly, I would say. Correct. Mm -hmm. Maybe even epithelioid? Epithelioid, yes, definitely. Um, but on the whole, they're relatively monotonous, not really seeing any mitotic figures. No. Is there? There's lots. Okay. A lot of mitotic figures. <laughs> I'll take your word for that. Yeah. This kind of doesn't sound projecting too well. No, it, it doesn't. Here. Most of them. Yeah. Most of them don't, but if you spend okay. a little time on this. Definitely some sort of tumor. Now, is this a normal? This is a variant. Variant, okay. Um, because the, the normal I would have given you in a different location. Okay. Will you tell me For the, the other location? Part. 
So this is still in the small intestine. Okay. Um, there's nowhere really on the slide to help you with that mm -hmm. besides the history that uh, they provide on the slide. Um, or you could see this in the small intestine. Okay. The most common location is stomach. Ooh, could this be like a, some sort of gist? Are you asking or telling me? Don't pull a dark and roll something. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gist. This is yeah. a gist. Epithelioid variant? This is an epithelioid <laughs> variant of gist, yes. With lots and lots of mitotic figures. And it's quite sizable, as you can tell from low powering the slide. Mm -hmm. Since we're nowhere near margins. Yeah. So what do you really want to call this? And there is some pleomorphism. Like, what do I really want to call this? And it's cellular. How'd you phone a friend on this? Well, okay, so I'm your phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Which is and is not fair when I know all the answers because I make the presentations. Um, minus, you know, I don't give them the slides, I find the slides. Uh, but okay, so this pretty much hits all the hallmarks of um, malignant epithelioid gist. Okay. Okay. Um, so in the handout, I do list the staging for gist. Um, I left it at uh, just like the basic staging, basic prognostic factors. The prognostic staging is extensive um, and it does differ between gastric and soft tissue gist, and this would be considered like soft tissue gist um, or non gastric <laughs> gist. Um, so it, it has uh, pr different prognostic staging. So if you're interested in those, uh, I would encourage you going to AJCC 8th edition and looking those up um, because it was just a, a little too much to have uh, in the handout for this. Um, but okay, so yes, malignant gist. All right, we see about 4,500 cases every year in the U.S. Um, they can happen at any age, but most of them are going to be in people 60 years old or older. There's no sex predilection. Uh, if you have someone who's maybe a little younger, like maybe in their 40s or 50, think about neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, if you see it in children, it, it rarely occurs in children, but if you see it, you need to think of carny triad. Uh, and we actually see uh, far more malignant gist in African Americans than other populations. The most common presentation for this will just be nonspecific GI bleeding. They may or may not have abdominal pain or obstruction, and these may just be incidental. They're going in for a scope for whatever reason, and they go, oh, what's this lesion? Let's uh, biopsy that, and it turns out to be gist. Um, familial cases, so I have a little bit about NF type 1, Carney triad, and Carney Stratakis syndrome. Um, so just know the differences between uh, those. Um, again, they're familial cases, so they're going to be rare, but they are things that you do need to think about. Um, most of these are going to occur in the stomach, and uh, when you're thinking about like succinate dehydrogenase deficient gist, or that's the SDH uh, def gist, um, most of those like they should occur in the stomach. Um, for uh, jejunal and ileal gist, that's going to be about a third of the cases, but that's usually where your, your neurofibromatosis associated gist will be. Um, duodenum is about 5%, colorectal is less than 5%, and there's rare reports of other locations. Um, so at the top, we have a, a small intestinal gist. You can see how it, they tend to be protruding, uh, tan white, they can be firm, they may or may not. Uh, have clear margins. Sometimes they can even come ruptured, so it can be really difficult sometimes to actually get the size from them. Um, your bottom histology is showing more of the spindle type where you have uh, vacuolization. Uh, and then I just have uh, a larger.
larger size of, of the same photos here. So they can be spindled. Our case is epithelioid. Uh, the cytoplasm is uh, eosinophilic, and you can see those cytoplasmic vacuoles. You may or may not see a mixoid or mitochondrial background. There can be areas that are, look cystic, and your vessel should be relatively inconspicuous. Uh, you may or may not see sphenoid fibers, which I have a picture of that on the next slide. Um, and that is specific to the small bowel. So if you're looking at a gist and you have sphenoid fibers, then you should be in the small bowel. Um, the pleomorphism tends to be rare um, if it's present. There's a little bit of pleomorphism in that case, but it's relatively mild to moderate. When you have dedifferentiation, dedifferentiation in gist actually means that you have admixed areas that are very low grade and areas that are high grade within the same tumor. Can see giant cells, can see tumor necrosis, but not often, and you can see extension into the mucosa. For your SDH deficient type, this is also known as pediatric type. So again, these tend to be located in the stomach. They uh, have a plexiform pattern, and they're often epithelioid. Um, what's important about these, though, is that they're non-responsive to uh, imitinib or Gleevec, uh, and they are indolent. So even though they um, are non-responsive to, to Gleevec and they'll have no mets, uh, they actually don't do too bad with them. Okay, positive stains. So the ones to know are DOG1, your C-Kit uh, or CD117, and both of these should be uh, diffuse. And DOG1 is, stands for? Discovered on GIST. Yes. <laughs> uh, the inset, so you can see those those like intense, almost salmon pink collections of collagen bundles. Those are sphenoid fibers. So, uh, so if you see that, that's uh, a finding in uh, s uh, small intestinal gist. Not always, but if you see it, it should be a, sm a small intestinal gist. Um, Negative stains, so if there's a mutation at any point in SDH, you're going to have a loss of uh, SDHB because it forms a complex. Um, Desmond will be negative, S100 will be negative. Um, your molecular mutations in CKIT and PDGF are alpha. Um, your duodenum has specific mutations that are often seen in KIT on exon 11 as well as exon 9 um, and I think those are roughly between like 10 to 30 percent of cases in the duodenum. Um, remember if you have a familial association you're going to see mutations related to those familial cases so like NF type 1 would be uh, NF kind of thing. Uh, your differential is actually fairly broad but your stains help you with those and treatment they need to excise it. It doesn't matter where it is, what it's involving, complete excision is primary treatment. And then you can look at your tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which would be your Gleevec, sunitinib, uh, et cetera. And uh, prognosis, so you have a lot in your handout about staging, prognostic factors, and um, you need to be careful with these because almost half your cases of small intestinal just are gonna be malignant. Okay, um, so the examples of the histology, the H&Es that are here, they're not really showing pleomorphism, so these are relatively bland cells. These are, again, a little more spindled. Our case is epithelioid as well as a malignant type. Um, so spend a little time on these. You see them all the time. Very common. Case 9. Okay. It is definitely a stroma tumor of some sort and low power. Um, let's see what we have. It's a little faded, but um, you can appreciate it's a little bit, I would say, well, like you do see it's sort of circumscribed. Mm -hmm. sort of. Um, look at the cells in here. And it's a little edematous. Yeah. It's like. Um, doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, a 
like the predominant cells in here, I would say, does look a little elongated. Okay. Spin like spindle like cells, maybe. I think if you go to the edge of the lesion, mm -hmm. it's a little, a little better, a little easier. Okay. Like here or? Yeah, I'm just kind of scoot okay. around. I, I agree that the staining isn't necessarily helping you with this, but you need to find the arrangement before you're looking too closely at nuclear features. It does seem to have maybe a wrap around around like certain vessels maybe. Mm-hmm. Sort of squint a little at it. Um, cells are relatively small. I'd say bland looking, maybe. Yeah, very bland. Mm -hmm. So it's a benign tumor some sort. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Um, some sort of spindle tumor. <laughs> hint? Uh, so my hint is you kind of need to go closer to your normal looking tissue okay. and not zoom in right away because you need to see the the features like what is this? Like hypercellularity. Okay. Yeah. And then it's hypercellular, but what is it? Because like saying something's hypercellular, it's like it's hypercellular with what? Yeah, the arrangement's not great. Like Maybe it's a like streaming better. a little. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I'm trying to push you that way. <laughs> okay, let's say streaming. Okay. Loose fascicular Vessels. bundles. Yeah, really okay. loose. So loose, Very they're nice. almost not there. Okay. Um, Usually it's a little more obvious. Yeah. But I, I think it's so prosticellular so in the center just, that's not helping you at yeah. all. But it's the prosticellular feature of this? Um, it, maybe? It can be. So. It can be. Like, normally they're more cellular yeah. than this, and I would So, the two, like, could it be, like, something like a schwannoma or something? Schwannoma's a good thought. Because of the two and the spindle cell the spitball in here, I don't know. Um, can you kind of just drive around the here? mucosa, but lower oh. power? Okay. So I'm looking for the one thing that I am not seeing, and it's kind of driving me crazy. I think there's more mucosa on the other side as well. Yeah. Why are you not doing what you should be doing? Maybe, uh, maybe that's the edge of... Here? Yeah, well, that's a little better with the fibers, but... Okay, it's still flimpy. <laughs> No, uh, what I was looking for is it would be really nice to have uh, lymphovascular, or sorry, lymphocytic cuffing. Cuffing, okay, oh. Because that's yeah. what you're supposed to see with this. Um. Mm. But it's like, you know, like the cells are streaming a little more, yeah. but the. I don't know if it's just preserved funny or... Not quite, but anyways. Alright, so you said could be Shornama. What else are you thinking? Mm, I mean, could be just a... Uh, just again. Could be. Strong tumor. What else kind of is in the realm of like really bland, spindly stuff? Oh, like myeloma. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Can you get us all 
solitary fibrous tumor down here? I think you can get them anywhere, right? <laughs> okay. I'm not really seeing the staghorn. Yeah. Cells, so, um, yeah and then you should also consider things like fibromatosis. Okay. Yeah. okay. But okay. All right. So this is like the wimpiest uh, shorn on the, on the planet that I'm not really happy with. So I'm actually like upset that I put this in the slide deck. So I apologize. Here Ooh. is, what saying is this? S100. Yeah. This is your S100. So this is probably why I put it in. Because I was like, the S100 nails it. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. It's like kind of staining the pasta cellar part. And like it the, is, but I'm like, there's not a lot of, because what you really should see are like these um, loose bundles. I'll, sh I'll show you, but if you just want to zoom in on the S100 in case yeah. you think I'm lying, it's not actually staining. You can see that like it, it actually I mean, is yeah, staining. Yeah, it is staining. So, I just say it's it, interesting, like this part yeah. that we're looking at is not staining. But like all this stuff, like this should have lymphocytic cuffing and like there's lymphocytes in there but they're not really like aggregates and they're mm -hmm. ah okay maybe I'll find a better example later to put in there because at low power that's what you should see even though the top right corner is actually a, a gastric sample oh but is that the lymphocyte that's the oh, cuffing that's so that's prominent. what you should see okay okay so these are rare okay when we think about our gist 4,500 cases a year in the U.S. alone, these are very rare. So if you're on the fence between just schwannoma, throw the S100 on it, throw a dog one on it, and that will uh, tell you which way to go. The age range is relatively the same. However, these are really common in women and uh, at least in the stomach. And in the stomach, uh, we see a four to one predominance of women. Uh, they tend to be asymptomatic, but again, they could present with abdominal pain, GI bleeding, or obstructive symptoms. There's extremely rare associations with neurofibromatosis. Um, so you should recall that um, schwannomas, non-GI schwannomas are associated with NF2. So GI schwannomas, not associated with NF2. Extremely rare association, but still so rare, it shouldn't happen, okay? <laughs> Most common site is the stomach, and they tend to be well circumscribed firm, tan grades, tan yellow masses. Uh, they lack a fibrous capsule or vascular hyalinization that you will see in schwannomas and other sites. Um, but again, the, they tend to have very bland spindle cells. You may see some palisading, but it tends to be very focal. Uh, you may see some pleomorphism, but it tends to be mild. You rarely see degenerative changes, and you rarely see mitotic activity. You should have those uh, that pairing peripheral uh, lymphocytic cuffs, um, and you may have a lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, which I think that lesion did have, um, but it's super wimpy. Okay, IHC, S100, SOX10, GFAP, well, GFAP, okay, not that specific, not that great. Negative stains, if you were thinking about just, it's negative for dog one, negative for C-Kit, uh, negative for SMA, Desmond, Schwannomas that are not in the GI tract tend to be positive for calretinin. Calretinin will be negative in these. And just a reminder again that they lack the NF2 gene alterations that you see normally in schwannomas. Your differential is kind of almost everything we said. Where else was I? Just Excision. So we just take them out. They're benign, and there's never been reported recurrence or metastases with these. Um, so the histology is sh actually showing you that the palisading and uh, how you should have like those those arrangements which we weren't really seeing in uh, the example that we had so that was what was so frustrating there again is your really diffuse s100 and your lymphocytic cuff all right case 10 okay pieces of um, this looks funny Yep. Very funny. It's a stromal lesion. So these look like like lymph or vascular spaces. And okay. there's a, um, a lot of them. They're kind of like wimpy, sort of not. They don't look very well formed. They look kind of thin, maybe. Just, it's weird. That's all I can say. <laughs> this is not what normal stroma should look like. 
Right. So I'm going to say this is the lesion. That is the lesion. And it's like blood vessels and lymph vessel, lymph channels, <laughs> lymphatics. Um, so it's like lymphangioma, maybe? Is that how yep. you call it? Um, uh, th that's the currently accepted name. There's okay. about 20 different names for this thing. Okay. But yeah, this is lymphangioma. Uh, so as you mentioned, it's very bland. Uh, lymphocytic channels, animal of them. Uh, your mucosa itself is actually going to be unremarkable. Um, and these can happen at any age, but they tend to occur more often in children. Um, if they're uh, mesenteric, they usually will occur before the age of five, and they happen uh, in males more often than females. Uh, in adults, you tend to see more of the luminal mucosal lymphangiomas, um, so, uh, and they also tend to be uh, asymptomatic, but they can range up to having acute abdomen symptoms. Um, so you need to think about, okay, is it causing obstructive symptoms that could lead to a perforation or infarction? Uh, these can induce volvulus and intussusception and a lot of familial associations. So your cystic hygroma, that's the lymphangioma. Uh, all, they're your major trisomies, so Patau, Edwards, Downs, those all have uh, association with lymphangioma. Um, so your sites, Distal terminal ileum is most common, so that's where why you can understand why you would possibly see volvulus and uh and acute abdomen, um, but you can see them pretty much anywhere. They tend to be sessile, they might be partially pedunculated, and they might show a whitish plaque. So as we can see on the endoscopy picture, um, they're going to see maybe this um, sessile lesion that has this plaque, it's sort of oozing a little bit, and they're going to biopsy that, and what you're going to see is what we have. So um, very uh, dilated anastomosing vascular channels, they are thin-walled, and they are lined by a single layer of, of endothelium, and the endothelium is going to be completely bland um, with hyperchromatic nuclei, so there should be like no reactive features that we tend to see a lot of the time in endothelium. Um, you may or may not see papillary projections or tufting in areas, and if you have large vessels that are involved, you might see some smooth muscle in the walls, but predominantly this is going to be thin vascular uh, spaces. Uh, within the spaces, as you can see on the top uh, picture, you're going to have eosinophilic pronaceous debris. You might have uh, red blood cells or lymphocytes in there. Um, and if it's a long-standing lesion, then your stroma is going to start becoming fibrotic, and you could see mixoid change or mast cells, hemocytic deposits. Um, so think about those kind of things. Um, you can see lymphoid aggregates or infiltrates, and you can see reactive germinal centers. So don't let those scare you. So stains. So everything that's going to stain uh, vessels. So CD31, CD34, CD or sorry, D240 is, is protoplanin, so that's going to also stain those channels. Um, your mutations, so if you're looking at something like uh, Turner syndrome, Down syndrome, uh, those mutations associated with uh, hereditary disease, those will be present. Uh, you could also see things like FLT4, PROX1, SOX18, FOX2, so lots of different mutations that can be associated with these. Um, the big things that you want to differentiate these from are things like your lymphangioma like Kaposi's, angiosarc, um, and uh, mesothelioma, but um, these are relatively common, so common things are common, uh, think of that. Uh, treatment, they can incise, so they can either go in surgically or endoscopy, they can unroof these lesions, however, just like cysts, um, they can persist if they're not completely excised, and uh, prognosis for most cases are benign, however, if there's internal organ involvement or mediastinal involvement, uh, that could be fatal, and this is normally associated with diffuse lymphangioma or lymphangiomatosis, um, and that cannot be resolved by surgery. If you have widespread lesions that are everywhere, you can't cut them all out. 
so we have more examples of our histology. There's an example of D240 for you, as well as uh, some reactive germinal centers. Case 11, this is our last case. More intestine and something going on here. It's a little overstained though. It's very overstained. <laughs> Uh, well, let's start here because this looks kind of exciting. So we're going to look at these nests of cells. That's just there. And then let's see if the other big thing we saw is similar. I think it was, no, that's just a lymphoid aggregate. Never mind. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if here. Yeah, I think this is just more of the same thing. So these sort of well-circumscribed nests of these bluish cells, sort of. Um, there does seem to be ample cytoplasm, you mm -hmm. know, not like crazy a lot, but you know, enough that you wouldn't say that, like, you know, some tumors are really high NC, so there's like moderate NC ratio. Um, the nuclear features, it's kind of hard to make out, but Some areas, because I'm, I'm pushing towards a neuroendocrine tumor at this point, um, like some of these look sort of more like the salt and pepper, as they call it, the scatter, powdery, like mm -hmm. sort of nuclear features. I think you maybe appreciate it a bit better here, but it's kind of hard because it's a little overstated. But that's beside the point. But the general architecture kind of looks like a neuroendocrine because of the sort of these nests. And you can always sort of throw some stain on there if you're doubting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they would throw stains on this, but yes. yes. Synaptophysin mm -hmm. because of the vesicles and the fusion protein thing, right? <laughs> and chromogranin, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, what else do you need to stain this with? I don't know. Give me. <laughs> What's the last? So you're pretty close. Um, so you need a KI sixty seven on this. Oh, okay. That is a must. I always forget that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, um, roughly two per hundred thousand people in both the U S. and the European Union. Uh, tends to be adults over the older than fifty, and incidence increases with age. Okay. Um, so for small bowel. Uh, males see it more than females. If you're looking at gastric neuroendocrine, we'll actually see it more commonly in, in women than men. Um, uh, the African American population tends to have about two times as many cases as the Caucasian population. And most of these cases will be asymptomatic, but just like everything else we've seen, there could be abdominal pain or obstructive symptoms. Um, if you're banking on carcinoid syndrome, less than 10% of patients will present with carcinoid syndrome. And there's a little bit in the handout about carcinoid. Um, but two thirds of the patients will have fibrous thickening of the right heart endocardium. So even if they don't have carcinoid syndrome, they're very likely to have uh, that fibrous thickening of the endocardium. Risk factors for well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma is, well, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, is a first degree relative with a net. Um, for just generalized neuroendocrine, that's obesity, male sex, older patients, and uh, patients who have had um, menopausal hormone therapy. This tends to occur in the duodenum, and in the duodenum, there's uh, multiple different types of neuroendocrine tumors that's beyond the scope of this talk. Um, so if you're interested in those, you can spend a little time on that. Uh, in the jejunum and ilium, they tend to be multifocal in about a third of the cases. Microscopic, you tend to see nests or trabeculae of monotonous cells that have abundant cytoplasm. Um, they can show either glandular, pseudoglandular, duct-like, rosette-like patterns, um, and they often have a, a vascular pattern that can be prominent. Uh, as was mentioned, well differentiated tends to be bland with the salt and pepper chromatin. 
uh, as well as scatter mitoses. The KI67 will be low, which is less than 2%. Poorly differentiated, you'll start seeing necrosis, frequent mitotic figures, and obviously a high KI67. Uh, and high K KI67 is greater than 20%, okay, in, in most of these cases. You can also see just overt small cell carcinoma, okay, so think about things like your crush, your molding, all that kind of stuff. Um, Lymphovascular invasion is common in these lesions. It doesn't matter if it's low grade, well differentiated, you can still see lymphovascular invasion. Uh, the gross photo we have is small intestine, and you can see some of the more nested pattern that we have in the case example that I gave you. For the insets, the top inset is showing lymphovascular invasion, the bottom inset is showing a somoma body, and uh, to the right you just have another example of nested neuroendocrine tumor. I see the pseudo rosettes too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for your immunohistochemistry, synaptophysin, chromogranin A, CD56, and your poorly differentiated tumors, PDL1, will be important for treatment. Uh, if you did a 24-hour urine, they're going to have elevated serotonin, or 5-HIAA, and uh, in the serum, they could have elevated chromogranin A. Molecular, they tend to have a loss of heterozygosity on chromosome 18, as well as uh, mTOR pathway mutations. Differentials for this tend to be adenocarcinoma and lymphoma. Uh, so if you're worried about lymphoma, where it's falling apart, you could uh, throw some like CD20, CD3 on there. Uh, for adenocarcinoma, um, your CD56 shouldn't be positive, and if you want to do like uh, more specific keratins that might help you. Treatment, they can try excising these, uh, they'll debulk if uh, it's causing obstructive symptoms or to try and get uh, serotonin uh, um, carcinoid uh, syndrome under control. Uh, they tend to treat these with somastatin analogs, uh, so that would be octreotide, lamreotide, uh, and these lesions actually tend to be very responsive to that and it can um, keep it under control, can even shrink the tumors, so very important. Um, your chemo radiation honestly has a little effect on low grade tumors, so it tends to do um, be more helpful with your poor, uh, poorly differentiated or high grade tumors. As with everything, prognosis is related to stage, however, uh, patients with well differentiated nets can survive 20 years with metastasis, and this is metastasis to the liver, okay? They'll be just fine for like 20-ish years. Um, small intestine overall has a worse prognosis. For example, the jejunum ileum, five-year survival is 60%. You have examples of, um, these are all uh, well differentiated. Uh, KI67 uh, will, uh, is, is really important because even though the tumor uh, can look really bland. That KI67 is really high. That's greater than 20% KI67. That makes this uh, a G3 or a high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, so don't be fooled by the H&E. You have to get that KI67. That's what we have for this week. There are 10 challenge cases. Uh, obviously, I will have a little bit of fun editing the, the video, and we'll figure out something for um, the WebEx. I know this session went a little longer than we have been, um, but if you like this video, please hit like. If you aren't subscribed already, hit subscribe, uh, share the video. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write comments. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter. I have both Twitter handles uh, below, and uh, we'll see you next week with um, more GI. Uh, we'll be looking into colorectal and a appendix lesions, so that should be very interesting.